Nick, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to worship with us this morning. Our sermon this morning will be on one of the characteristics that our Lord Jesus Christ uh, gave us an example of how to live. We ought to live uh, like Christ. We are Christians, meaning Christ follows us, and we ought to model our lives after uh, what he uh, showed us to do. And being humble was one of the characteristics that are not just important to follow, but also for many of us difficult to follow. And I know that was the case for myself. So before we get into uh, what it uh, means to be humble for us as Christians, I looked at what the word humble itself uh, means. What, what does it mean to be humble, humbleness? Uh, it means being modest, it means being lowly, poor, not arrogant, and not proud. Uh, those are qualities that I think many people would agree are good to have, yet it's difficult to obtain because who wants to be poor? Who wants to be lower than anybody else? Um, many people are proud of their accomplishments, being proud of the groups they are part of. I'm proud to be a firefighter, that sort of thing, and that comes natural. Um, but Jesus um, wants us not to be proud. He doesn't want us to put ourselves higher than others. He wants us to be humble. As a, as a child growing up, and especially as a teenager, I struggled with this a lot, and I know that um, I really uh, wasn't very humble at all. Uh, I, I think I compared myself too much with my peers uh, on, a, on a superficial level. I think I looked at them and thinking, oh, I'm better than them, I'm smarter, faster, stronger, <laughs> you, know, you name it. And I guess as a teenager, that's just what teenagers do. Uh, but uh, being humble uh, is something that we have to learn that doesn't necessarily just come to us and we're not necessarily born with, but uh, we ought to grow into this. So Jesus is our example in all things, and he also gives us a great example in being humble. Him having lived the perfect life on earth, we can trust that if we are striving to be more like him, we can also learn to be more humble. And uh, when we want to have an example on who's humble, as I said, as a teenager, I compared to myself to my peers, and that was the mistake I was making, uh, we really ought to compare ourselves to Christ. So I would like to look at uh, his, Jesus' birth, his life, and his death, to look for examples in the New Testament that show us and teach us how we ought to become more humble. Jesus was born to unmarried parents. He was born in a stable and laid in a food trough. Luke 2, 4 through 7 Luke 2, 4 through 7 is the re record of Jesus' birth. And it says, Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now that is a very humble beginning of his life. I can hardly think of any more humbler beginnings than being in a stable, a place where animals are kept. It had to be dirty in there. It had to be cold. It had to be uncomfortable. There was no bed there. Uh, I mean, this was a really humble circumstance. It wasn't a hospital. It wasn't their comfortable home. So he started off with being very uh, humble in his birth. Soon after his birth, he became a refugee. As you remember, he had to flee to Egypt. And we have that uh, record in Matthew 2.13. Matthew 2.13 reads, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
We have the tendency to look down on refugees, um, and uh, so f it is difficult circumstances for refugees. They're foreigners in a country, they're not necessarily wanted, uh, and, and they're not in their normal surroundings, a different language, different culture. Uh, I'm sure they had a very difficult time during that time that they had to flee to Egypt. Uh, and that, again, is a very humble beginning of Jesus' life. And then thirdly, uh, the place he was growing up, his childhood, he spent in an area uh, that was very unremarkable. It was a rural area that was um, outside of Judea, it was Nazareth, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Jews at the time looked down on people from Nazareth. If you look up John 1, 45 and 46, we read the following. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So they had preconception, uh, their preconceived notions about the place Jesus was growing up in. Uh, he wasn't off to a good start. His parents were blue-collar workers. Uh, his, his dad was a carpenter. He came from an area that, w that wasn't uh, anything special. It was actually looked down upon. He didn't go to any fancy schools. Uh, so very humble beginning for Jesus, his life on earth. Moving on to his adult life. Jesus was giving powers because Jesus, you know, was both God and man at the same time. And he had the power to, uh, to do wonders. He could heal, he could walk on water, he could raise people from the dead. However, he did not use his powers for his own gain. He could have made himself a mansion, he could have made himself a, a nice carriage with strong horses, uh, he could have made himself all the money he wanted, angels for protection. He didn't do any of those things. Matthew 8, 1 through 4 reads this. When he had come down from the mountain, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He actually told him not to tell anybody. He wasn't boasting about it. He didn't, wanna, he didn't do it to improve his status or to, um, to make himself higher than everybody else. He actually told him, Don't, don't tell everybody. I did this for you. So he, he didn't do it to improve him, his own status, and he also didn't do it to uh, meet his own needs. He always focused on others. Uh, he tried to help others. He, he loved others, and that's one of the central teachings of Christianity, that we ought to love one another. Um, and uh, he... Um, he constantly helped others even when he was extremely exhausted. One example we have is after the death of his cousin, uh, John the Baptizer. Uh, right afterwards, Jesus actually uh, healed a, a lot of people and fed the 5,000. This is recorded for us in Matthew 14, 1 through 21, and I'm not going to read that. That's almost a whole chapter, but uh, uh, you get the idea that uh, no matter if he was exhausted or tired, he was always focusing on other people's needs. Another aspect of Jesus' humble life was that he, uh, he was uh, not rich. He was actually, at the end of his life, homeless and poor. Matthew 8.20 reads the following for us. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So he didn't focus on having a nice palace or uh, you know, living in the most expensive hotel or anything like that. He, he lived his life humbly, and by living humbly, 
uh, he's actually showing us what our focus ought to be. Our focus ought not to be on comforts on the earth, on status that we have here on earth, titles, um, appreciation from other people, but rather to focus on God, focus on our true citizenship, which is in heaven, focusing on doing the things necessary to become right with God. That's what he was uh, modeling for us with his humble life. So Jesus had a humble birth, a humble life, and he was also very humble in his death. When Jesus died, he was forsaken by his closest friends and followers. Matthew 26, verses 74 and 75 records the following for us. Then he began to curse and swear. This is Peter speaking. He began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know this man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So we, he went out and went, wept bitterly. Peter was one of his closest friends. Uh, he was the inner circle of three. And uh, he, uh, even he left Jesus. So when he was uh, being uh, tried in front of the high priest and the Romans, the Roman government, and crucified, he was more or less forsaken, and he was by himself. He was also ridiculed. He was spat upon. Matthew 27, the next chapter, records in verses 28 through 30. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. So they were making fun of him. They were ridiculing him. They were, they were beating him. They were hurting him severely. And Jesus then, we all know, suffered a lot of pain, he was whipped, and he was nailed to the cross and died a horrific, terrible death. When uh, I read about a survey where people were asked what they fear most about death, and the top three answers were uh, unknown destiny, pain, and loneliness. And we as Christians, we don't have to worry about the unknown destiny. Uh, Christians know we will be with God in heaven one day. But we still often worry about the other two things, which is pain that uh, may be involved with the dying process and loneliness. We don't want to die alone. And Jesus did have to suffer through those two. He suffered an enormous, unbelievable amount of pain, one of the worst pains the Roman government knew how to punish people with. And he also suffered the loneliness. So Jesus was humble in his birth. He was humble throughout his entire life, homeless, poor, uh, focusing on others, not on himself. Uh, he never used his powers for his own gain. Uh, forsaken by his closest friend, ridiculed, died a horrible death. Throughout his entire life, he modeled for us what it means to be humble. We also have other useful and uh, educational uh, scriptures on humility, where we can learn more about what it means to be humble. The Apostle Paul records for us in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is something else that goes along with humility that we have to learn because we, have, we often have the tendency uh, to want more and better things, to have a bigger, nicer house, to have a faster, fancier car, um, more privileges at our jobs, and so on. Uh, the Apostle Paul, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, is writing that we ought to have contentment, and if we have contentment, that it is great gain for us. The word gain means something to be gained, meaning we have to strive for it. So it's not something you can snap your fingers or you have it. It's not something you're born with. It's something you have to work on, something you have to uh, build up to, something you have to learn. And then when you gain it, then you have an improvement in your life. So again, godliness with contentment is great gain. In Luke chapter 18, uh, Jesus has the parable for us. That was our scripture reading this morning, and I'd like to read it again. 
that's Luke 18, 9 through 14. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for every one who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This brings me back to me as a teenager comparing myself to others thinking that I'm better than the others and I was terribly wrong and I wish I could turn back time and change my thinking at the time. But the Pharisee was doing the same thing. He was looking at other men and thinking, oh, this tax collector is just terrible. He's doing terrible things. But he wasn't looking at the spiritual the spirituality in the tax collector, the, the desire of the tax collector to be close with God, the desire to do the right things, the striving of turning the life around, of, of repenting, of doing the right thing and being right with God. The, the Pharisee didn't see it. He only saw the outward uh, things that the tax collector did and uh, did not see the desires and the striving and we all know we can, we'll never be perfect, but if we follow God's plan of salvation and if we walk in the light as he is in the light, trying to and striving the best we can to do the right thing, then we will be right with God, whereas the Pharisee was not right in his heart. He was only right on the outside, like the whitewashed tomb. Matthew 6, 1 through 4 is another helpful verse in this. It's Matthew 6, 1 through 4, and it reads, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do charitable deeds, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father, who sees in secret, will himself reward you openly. So we as Christians, we ought to do good things to others. We ought to love others and help others. And we ought not to do it out of the wrong motives. God is more interested in our motives than he is in our deeds. God knows what we think, he knows what we believe, he knows why we do it, our motivations. And if we go and help someone move their furniture because we want others to see and we go around pronouncing, hey, I'm, I'm helping so-and-so move, uh, and that's the only reason you're doing it, you're doing it for the wrong motives. You, sh you ought to just go and do it and not talk about it and not praise yourself. We ought to praise God and not ourselves. Matthew 5.5 5 will be our last verse in this uh, section. Uh, Matthew 5.5, 5, that's the chapter one right before the one we just read. It says it's a part of the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek and humble go hand in hand. Uh, some say it's the same word. Uh, they're very similar. Uh, we are blessed if we are humble, and we shall inherit the earth. Uh, so God wants to bless us if we are humble. This is something that's very important to God, so we ought to strive to be more humble, just like Jesus was. I've once heard somebody say, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I find that very helpful, not thinking less of myself, because we are children of God we are special in God's eyes. 
but thinking of ourselves less. We ought to think of others more. We ought to think of God first and, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what our thoughts ought to be on rather than ourselves. Our final verse this morning is, uh, will be Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, where Jesus sums it all up. And if you don't have this underlined, I would en encourage you to underline it in your Bible. I actually taped it to my locker at the fire department uh, as a reminder for me. Uh, that's Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, or through 40, actually. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the, uh, then the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you take all the law, everything we learn in here, Jesus just summed it up for us. Love God and love others. If we love God and we love others before ourselves, that's what being humble is all about. Now this morning, if you need help in your walk, in your, in your, in your striving to be more like Jesus, we as Christians, we want to be more like Christ. One aspect is being humble. If you need help with that, you can come to one of the elders, deacons, or myself, and we'll pray with you, we'll help you. Uh, if there's any other aspect of your spiritual life, we'll be more than happy to meet with you and talk with you. Or if you're not a Christian this morning, God has a plan for you. God wants you to be with him in heaven. He wants you to walk the spiritual life, which is so sweet for us Christians. And the plan is this. You need to hear the gospel first. Then you need to believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Uh, and uh, repent of your sins. Repenting means to turn away from our sins because sin is what separates us from God. Without repentance, we cannot be with God because God will not let anything defiled into heaven. When we repent of our sins, we also need to confess our belief publicly that we are now want to be Christians. We believe in Christ. And then be baptized, which is being buried in the watery grave of baptism. That's where we come in contact with the blood where our sins get washed away and we come back out of the water as new men, as, as sons and daughters of Christ, of God. And then we need to continue to live faithfully. In John 1, 1, uh, 1 John 1, 7, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we live our, full li our whole life faithfully, we will be with God in heaven one day. So if your desire is to be right with God this morning and you fall short, I would encourage you to come forward this morning as we stand and sing the song of